Okay, we're continuing to look at jigsaw puzzle theology, as I call it, uh, an attempt to draw some lessons from the idea of a jigsaw puzzle, hopefully based on biblical principles. I do, as I said, fully intend to abuse this metaphor and stretch it beyond all usefulness. Uh, no, in seriousness, uh, I want to use it and, you know, not be bound by these ideas, but think about some of these ideas. So this second class is a place for each piece and each piece in its place. A place for each piece and each piece in its place. And so I want you to think about this idea of you look at the picture of a puzzle and then you look at these jumbled up pieces. And you think, okay, how am I going to get from this mess, this jumble of pieces, to that finished picture? Well, most of us are going to look for the corner pieces, right? And, and from there, work around the, the edge. And, and so, as we're getting started, we really want those pieces, really want to find these these foundational pieces and then we work in from there maybe finding some inner picture that goes together hopefully it's not all just blue sky in the middle but we go filling in the middle parts of the puzzle now as we think about us as a puzzle I think we need to recognize that we're not all corner pieces as much as we like to be. And we're not even all edge pieces as much as we'd like to be. And there's a tendency to really celebrate those pieces, to really celebrate the people with gifts, especially dealing with Sunday worship, right? He's a talented speaker. He's a gifted Bible teacher. He is you know, a, a really good worship leader. Oh, this guy, the prayers he can do. Oh, this lady, when she gets up and she reads scripture, it just touches me. And we feel like if you're not one of those pieces, well, you're just kind of along for the ride, okay? It, that can happen. I'm not saying it always does, but sometimes it can feel that way. The corner piece, the edge piece, right? The preacher, the song leader. And you've got a whole group of people whose talents don't lie along those lines who are never going to feel the same appreciation at church. And I think that has been one of our problems. And I think we need to learn to celebrate all the pieces and appreciate all the pieces, right? Because think about Ephesians 4. Let's look at this verse. I know we were studying Ephesians before we kind of got broken up by this pandemic. And one of the last sections we saw in the class I was teaching, at least, was Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. I want to go back and read those verses. It says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ has appointed it. Let me read that again. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. All right, as he broke it up, as he decided things would fall. And then there's a little excursus on, on this verse from the Old Testament. Let's go down to verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. 
From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I love that passage. I'll confess that. I I have taken that passage to be one of the defining passages for me as I work in ministry, uh, as I work a few years with local churches, but especially as I've worked in missions and and worldwide evangelism. Uh, I think that the principles here are really important. Now, we used this passage last class to talk about that God gives people to the church. And I think we need to to grasp that concept, the, the idea that you are a gift to the university church. You are a gift to the university church. God put you here for a reason. Now, in in verse 11, we see that God gave leaders, right? The the apostles, the prophets, the the evangelists, the the pastors, the teachers, right? These are typically the the people that we think about as leaders. And, And so God has gifted people with the ability to lead his people, all right? The ability to minister to his people, ways to use talents of teaching, talents of speaking, talents of seeking, uh, singing, okay? That, that God has gifted these people to his church, but not, but not with the end, with the goal that they do all the work that all the ministry happened through them. Verse 12 says they are there to equip the saints for works of service. That's really important. That's really important. Leaders are in the congregation to to equip the body to be what it's supposed to be and to help everyone else discover their potential and their way of working. And then you get down to verse 16 and it it makes that point so clear. Right? Let me read it again. It says Sorry, turn the page. It says, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The body doesn't just grow because you have a wonderful preacher. The body doesn't grow because you have excellent elders. The body doesn't grow because you have the most amazing staff. And sometimes we think if we can just get those people in the right place, then the body will grow. No, the body grows as each part does its work. And so if we have parts of the body that aren't doing their work, the body's not going to grow. You think about the jigsaw puzzle, right? And and like I said, you want to have the corner pieces, you want to have the edge pieces. But boy, have you ever gone to the trouble to do a whole jigsaw puzzle when you get to the end, you're missing a piece? And it really doesn't matter if it's a corner or an edge or if it's the middle of the blue sky. It ruins the picture. It ruins the puzzle. And you think, I've done all of this and I don't get to see the finished product because I'm missing one piece. Churches are like that. We will never be what we're supposed to be until each part is doing its work. So, you know, it's not a matter of all of us trying to be a corner piece. That doesn't work. That doesn't get us anywhere. That doesn't finish the image of the church. Doesn't allow us to be the picture that we're supposed to be. We're only going to be what God envisions for University Church when we help each member find ministry, find a way of working. The 
that means that we've got to be helping people identify their way of serving and help them be active at that. Now, you know, I mentioned before, mentioned last class, these three-step vision that we have of upward, inward, and outward. And, and those three words need to be at the forefront of our thinking about our church, upward, inward, outward. That's who we are. That's how we grow. Upward, we come together to worship God as we're trying to imitate Him and become like Jesus. And inward, as we're forming a, a united body. And then outward, that each of us is doing something to serve, doing something to build the church, doing something to be Jesus in our community. So, what are some thoughts about how we can go about this? Well, first off, I think that as a leadership, we need to expect to be positive and affirming when faced with ministry proposals. Doesn't mean we're always going to say yes. Doesn't mean we're always going to be able to say yes. Doesn't even mean that we're going to explore the proposal exactly as it's been made to us. Maybe we're going to ask questions. Maybe we're going to push back. But in the end, we need to find a way to say yes most of the time. Okay? I, I know there's physical limitations. There's money limitations. And, you know, if, if everybody comes in saying that they want to get up and preach, I don't, I don't think we're going to say that. Uh, if someone says that they want to come in and play their violin on Sunday morning, well... There's a lot of ramifications to that. There's a lot of considerations from theological viewpoint, sociological viewpoint. I mean, it's not just that simple, right? But when someone says, I have this idea how I want to serve other people, we need to help it become reality. At least let them try, okay? And that person's way of serving isn't going to be my way of serving. I, I was in a meeting where, you know, one man who's a roofer said he wanted to use his roofing skills to bless other people and that he thought others who were gifted at construction, they, they could work together and, and fix up the, the homes of some of our older members, for example. Wonderful idea may not be practical, may be practical, I don't know, but it's worth trying, it's worth encouraging. But don't expect me to get up on a roof and swing a hammer. You're going to get nasty results, okay? I'm pretty good at bending nails and pretty good at, you know, hitting all around nails. I'm not that good at driving nails. But there's some people that are really good at that, right? And so their way of serving isn't going to be my way of serving. Another man at that meeting talked about wanting to, to do soccer camps for some of the young people in the area. Wonderful idea, right? Wonderful idea. And I think especially as we look at ideas that don't take a lot of resources but just need some encouragement, let's do it. Secondly, I think our priority needs to be on outside the walls ministries. Too often churches get hung up on things done in the building and things done on Sunday morning. And one good thing I'm hoping that comes out of this nasty pandemic is that the church sees how much we can do outside the building. And that the church realizes that we are still church out and about. And in fact, that's what we're called to be, right? And then we need to remember the church will not and cannot meet every need. We're going to see some things that need to be done that either we don't have anyone with the talents necessary to take care of that, or maybe we don't have the resources, or maybe we're just too stretched. You know, we don't have the time resources. We can't do everything. There will be good things we won't be able to do, and that will be frustrating. 
But we need to be looking at them and seeing those things. And finally, when someone describes something that isn't right, we need to take that as an offer to help. (laughs) I think too often we feel like that if someone comes and complains, that's kind of where their responsibility stops. And I think that's where their responsibility begins. If God has brought this problem to your attention. He's put it on your heart that something needs to be done about it. It's not just done about it. It's not just so that you go tell one of the elders that this needs to be done or you tell the minister this should have been done differently. No. What are you going to do? How are you going to help? Let let me give you a personal example. When you go in by the chapel at UCC, there's an acrylic map on the wall, a map of our physical plant. It was there when we came here in 2006, hasn't been updated, and it was out of date then, okay? Uh, Since we've been at UCC, since 2006, the building has never looked like what's represented on that map. Now, the reason that's frustrating to me is when college students come to visit, that's the door they usually come in. Now, a lot of other people are going to come in from the other side, okay? But, but that north door is the one nearest the campus and most logical for students. And I'm especially aware of this problem at the beginning of the school year. Our college class is on the other side of the campus, uh, the church campus, and it's in a part that isn't even represented on that map. And, and I would get so frustrated. And I think, why doesn't somebody do something about this? Until finally, after writing about some of these things and teaching other people about some of the things, it was like, hello, God put that in my heart. He brought that need to my attention. It's up to me to take care of it. So what I try to do the first Sunday of the school year is be around that door as much as I can to help the college students get to where they're going. When we were at the uh, HEB retreat this year, the uh, man who runs the HEB camp that we were at uh, told a story about uh, Howard Butts that you know was the founder of HEB and founder of that camp that when you go into the campground there's a part where you have to drive through the river and so he was bringing Mr. Butts in. Mr. Butts was dressed as always in a suit and tie and at one point he said stop the car. He stopped the car there in the middle of the river. Mr. Butts got out of the river, out of the car, waded through the river in his suit, and went over and picked up some trash and brought it back to the car. And the, the camp director said, Mr. Butts, you could have told me, and I, I would have gotten out to do that. And he said, no. He said, God showed that problem to me. It was my responsibility. That's the attitude we need at church people. Your responsibility isn't complaining. Your responsibility isn't pointing out what's wrong. Your responsibility is to help fix the problem. There's a lot of things that we can do around church that don't take a a degree in ministry to do, (laughs) you know? And it's just a matter of doing it, you know? So, wanted to share that. As we think about our church, I think we need to focus on this upward, inward, outward. That we're coming together as a body to worship. That we're meeting in smaller groups where we can share and we can edify one another. We can confess to one another. We can build each other up. And then finally, we are actively involved in a ministry. Now, I know that some may say, look, 
I'm just not physically able to do the things that I used to do. Well, there's lots of ministries that that aren't that physical in nature, okay? Um, I know a, a 90-year-old lady or over 90 now in Cuba who is an amazing prayer warrior. I'll use that term. The things that have been done because she set her mind to them and prayed about them for years. It's amazing. And one of the last times I was there, Tony uh, Fernandez and I were going to head out on a trip across the island. And, you know, it was a little, not dangerous, but um, problematic in that there were fuel shortages and he's got an old car and the roads aren't that great. And, and this lady came into church Sunday and said, what time do you leave? And I knew what that meant. That meant she was going to be praying. And Tony said, Odie is hardly going to sleep this week but she's because she's going to be praying for us all the time we're gone. You can do that. You can write notes. You can write letters. I, I heard of a lady who had a cookie ministry who every time a new family would come to her neighborhood, she would take a plate of cookies and welcome them to the neighborhood and tell them where different things were and then say, oh, by the way, if you don't have a church, why don't you come Sunday and join us? And they said that lady had brought more people to church than anybody else, and she did it with cookies. Okay, so there's lots of ways to serve. But we need to find ours. Because each of us needs to have a place. And each of us needs to be in our place. So, we're continuing to talk about jigsaw puzzle theology. Got one more lesson after this. Thanks for joining me.